Good morning. It's great to see everyone out this morning. I want to welcome everyone, especially those that are visiting. If you are visiting, we'd request that you take a card from the so we'd have a record of attendance. If you haven't done so in the lobby, pick, pick up a bulletin. A reminder to turn your cell phones off or on uh, mute so they do not interrupt our time together. Want to remember our missionaries that we support with uh, Velopi, Dave, Brian, and Steve. We got a nice note acknowledging and thanking us for the uh, uh, support that we have of uh, Brian Hall. I'll post that on the uh, bulletin board. Upcoming events and announcements. One reminder, we started it this last Wednesday on a series of lessons on church history, which I think will be very beneficial to all of us. So uh, make sure you're planning for that. If you have any questions about it, see Brian. Uh, on the 12th at 6 o'clock is a uh, dinner celebration for Allie and Seth for their wedding shower. Um, Jerry's cooking some, so... Yeah, but I know you are, so... And there'll be some great food here then, so I want to remember that. Uh, Grant County is back on their regular Sunday evening, Wednesday schedule. They're meeting at 6 on Sunday evenings and at 7 on Wednesday. And then uh, the final announcement before we get to prayers, uh, this morning is our normal potluck dinner. There's plenty of food. We invite everybody to stay. Uh, it'll be shortly after our uh, closing prayer. Uh, and then we'll be meeting again for uh, a worship and some time together shortly after that. Sick and prayer request, Dale and Sherry are home, not feeling well. Chris Woodard is not feeling well. She's some injuries, so I um, want to remember her. Vernus Cottrell's home, not feeling well, had some bladder uh, issues. And then friends of Sandy, Keith, and Becky were in a car accident in January, are in separate nursing homes and having a lot of struggles on their recovery. So that's all the announcements I have. Let's begin our time together with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we come before you so thankful for this day, so thankful for this time that we're able to meet with your family and worship you. We pray that as we enter into this worship, the things we say and do will be pleasing to you. And as a result of our time together and our worship and fellowship together, we will be encouraged to live a week that's pleasing to you and that others will see, uh, see the light of our lives and see you in our lives. We pray today as we enter in this time and Brian, be with Brian as he delivers a message. And if there's someone here that needs to make changes in their life, that they'll have the strength and courage and humility to do that today. Be with us in everything we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of life. What will your answer be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Sadly, you'll stand if you're unprepared. Trembling, you'll fall on your knee. Facing the sentence of life or of death, what will that sentence be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Now is the time to prepare, my friend. 
Make your soul spotless and free. Washed in the blood of the crucified one, he will your answer be. What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? <clears throat> this will be our song before our opening prayer. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be able to assemble here this morning to come together as your church on this day. We're thankful, Father, for the strength of our faith and the willingness of each and every one of us to be here today. We're thankful, Father, for the blessings in this life, especially the measure of health that we enjoy. We ask that you continue to bless us in all that we go through in this life as we prepare for the next one. Let us love one another, Father, and help one another through trying times. For we know there are many who are sick, both physically, spiritually. Help us to see a need and help us to act upon it. Let us make good decisions in this life, Father. Let us consider you in everything that we do. Everywhere we go. We pray, Father, that we'll always surround ourselves with situations that are good for our soul. We ask you to guide us in those endeavors. Be with us, Father, this day as we assemble here and worship you in public 
worship, be with Brian as he delivers a message to us. We pray, Father, for the church here in this community that it might grow strong, both numerically and spiritually. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. This will be the song before scripture reading and our lesson this morning. If you will, please stand with me as we sing together. <clears throat> no tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There'll be no sadness, all will be gladness when we shall join that happy band. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. Please be seated. This morning's scripture reading will be taken from 1 John chapter 13, and then we're going to jump down right to 18 verses uh, Verses 18 through 21. Again, that is 1 John chapter 13. And then after 13, we're going to read chapters, I mean, verses 18 through 21. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not, does not touch him. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding, and we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ, that is true, God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Glad that you're here today. Visitors, members alike, so glad that you're able to join us, meet with us, the Point Pleasant Church of Christ, for a few minutes this morning. Um, thank you, Gavin, for reading that great scripture to us from 1 John. 
And uh, what that is telling us, it is promising us that we can be sure, we can be confident that we have eternal life. And that is so true. This morning, I want to talk with you for a few minutes about the subject of eternity. There's hardly a more serious word than this word, eternity. God created us to be like him. God created us to, to be in possession of eternal spirits. It's quite remarkable when you think about it. And after all, we have been made in his image, according to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Long ago, Solomon said something very interesting in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. He said that God has put eternity in our hearts. Let me just suggest a thought, and hopefully everyone will agree with me when I say it. I believe it's to be true. The Bible was written because of eternity. Eternity is ours in a manner of speaking. We have something to do with this word that is in front of you on the slide. We have something to do with eternity. And because this is so, we really do need to give serious thought to this limitless duration of time because there are only two places that we can, with, in which we can inhabit eternity. Those two places are identified in God's word as heaven and hell. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. On another occasion, he said in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, marvel not at this, which I find to be a remarkable thing for him to say, because uh, when you really break it down, you can't help but marvel at what he's saying. But he says, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will, shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So this is very straightforward language. It is very serious language. Heaven is a beautiful place. Heaven's going to be beautiful for all of us who finally arrive there. A place that God is preparing for those who are the beneficiaries of his grace. In stark contrast to that, hell is a horrible place. If we are to conceive of these two places as being uh, exact opposites, and, and I don't know if that's true or not, but, but if we are to think of them as being uh, uh, opposite destinations, then hell must truly be a horrible place. It is described in Scripture as a place of darkness, a place of pain for all who have lived their lives on this earth beyond the reach of his grace, which is itself quite remarkable when you think of all that God has done to invite us and to implore us into his grace. And yet, there are those who make the decision not to seek out his grace. The thought of heaven should fill us with wonder and with awe. The thought of hell should fill us with dread and with fear. Quite naturally, the question that arises is this one. What do I need to do to go to heaven? And what do I need to do to avoid going to hell? A more sobering question than this has never been asked. What's more, the God of heaven wants you to have the answer to this question because we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, that the Lord desires all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Lord wants you to have knowledge. He wants you to have the knowledge of the truth. And by that knowledge, he wants you to be saved. That's what God wants for you. He wants that for all of us. Thankfully, we don't have to go very far for the answers that we need. The answers are in the word of his grace. And as we look at his word this morning, we actually discover something quite surprising when it comes to the subject of heaven and hell. And that is that there are two ways to go to heaven. 
And there are two ways to go to hell. Because eternity and the soul, because these are, are quite serious, don't you know? You, you need to be informed about this so that there, there are no mistakes that are made. So then what are the two ways to go to heaven? And what are the two ways to go to hell? I think that, that we can talk about this today in, in simple terms, in basic terms, and I think that we can be brief as well. Let's begin with the subject of, of heaven. There are two paths available for us for going to heaven. Two paths, actually. You need to know this. God allows some people to go to heaven without knowing the way to heaven. Okay? God allows some people to go to heaven without knowing the way to heaven. Does this surprise you? There are people who will go to heaven, who will be in heaven without knowing God, without knowing Christ, without knowing the Christian life, without knowing his word. And of course, I recognize that I have to demonstrate this from the scriptures, that this is what you require of me. Many of you already know that I must be talking about those who are not accountable for their actions like infants and small children and perhaps others without mental capability or mental maturity. Consider a couple of texts with me, if you would. In Matthew, the 18th chapter, Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, we, we find this. And this is Jesus, of course, it sets it up that way in verse 1, Matthew 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? All right, that's a, that's a curious question, isn't it? And, and one that I might uh, have asked Jesus as well. Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name, receives me. Now with your Bibles open, turn to the next chapter, Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 13 and reading down through verse 15. Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. I guess they didn't think that Jesus needed to, to that this was needless, useless time for Jesus. But so the, re, the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Surely there's only one way to account for, for, for Jesus' statement. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Children are innocent when it comes to this matter, this grave, serious matter of sin, in that God does not view them as accountable for their actions, that God does not hold them responsible. If this is not the case, if I'm wrong about this, if they are not without sin, then, then pray tell, how did they become sinners? I want to know that. How did these innocent children, these infants, how did they become sinners? Did they inherit the sins of their parents as some are teaching today? If I was looking for a church, this is one of the important questions that I would, I would ask. What do you think about children? What is your, what is your view? What do you think the Bible teaches in regard to children? Are they innocent or are they guilty of sin? No, that can't be the case that they are guilty of sin. We read in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, the prophet Ezekiel was talking about this, this very matter of, of sin and who's guilty of sin and, and who isn't and, and how they became guilty of, of sin. And he said this, the prophet said in Ezekiel 18, verse 20, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. 
The truth is, Ezekiel tells us exactly how each person becomes guilty before God. Again, going back to Ezekiel 18, verse 20, the soul who sins will die, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Sin is what keeps people out of heaven. People will not go to heaven because of sin. Does anyone see, when you look around, when you look at the small children around us, does anyone see any wicked small children or, or infants living a life of sin? Do you see that? No, that's not in our experience. Believe me, because we're all sinners, we know what sin is. And we don't see any wicked small children in our midst today. The reason children are not sinners is because they do not have the mental capacity or shall we say the moral and spiritual capacity as well to commit sin or to be responsible for sin. Children are, are born without sin and if they are free from sin, then obviously they are free of the only thing that can keep them from heaven should they die. One must not ignore the meaning of Jesus' words. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. It's not that children are saved. That would probably be the wrong way of saying it. It's not that they are saved because to, sa to be saved or, uh, is to be rescued. And, and they have no need to be rescued from sin. So it's not that they are saved. It's, it's probably best, if we can use an English term, it's probably best to say that they are safe. Safe from sin, safe from guilt, the guilt of sin, and safe from the Lord's condemnation toward sin. Now, the only other way that I know of and that the Scriptures teach for you to go to heaven is by knowing the way to heaven, by knowing the truth that God has shown each of us in His Word. Human beings come into the world without sin. But of course, as you know, as all of us have experienced, children grow into adults. And in that growing process, they become responsible for their actions. And due to sin, they become, they become dead to God. They become guilty of trespasses and sins. They become guilty. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and look at what Paul says to the Ephesian Christians. Now, these are individuals who know the way of righteousness. They know the way to heaven, and they are following it. But he writes to them and says, I want you to remember where you came from, where you came from spiritually and, and, and that kind of environment and that kind of thinking. And so he says in Ephesians 2, verses 1 and following, and you he made alive. God made you alive who were in the past, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the, of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. And the meaning there is, is that we took on this nature, not, be, not human nature, he's not talking about that, he's talking about the nature that we have adopted through a long process of living away from God, that it has become a part of us. It's become a part of our lifestyle, a part of our thinking, and all of that has changed because we're now, we've now been enlightened by the gospel and we've been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in fact, he goes on in chapter two and talks about what has that, that change, that transformation that has come over them. He refers to them as being dead in trespasses and sins. And the reason they became dead is because they now have an experiential knowledge of sin. It's not just head knowledge that we have of sin, it's we've actually lived that life. We've actually lived apart from God. We've actually lived the, 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 the sinful, unrighteous, ungodly life. And now, when we are in that state, that is when we need the knowledge of God. Because having that knowledge 
that gives us the, the, the guidance and the direction that we need to come to God. Due to personal sin, our greatest need in life is to know the way of righteousness that ultimately leads to eternal life. And not just head knowledge, because head knowledge, just knowing something between your two ears, that's never been sufficient. We need to know God. We need to know His grace by knowing His will and then yielding ourselves to it as a matter, each of us, as a matter of our personal experience. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul uh, was writing to the young preacher and he gives him this bit of the theology and he tells him this, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved. And that word men is generic. It means men and women, human beings and desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Having known sin, we must now know the way into life, into eternal life. And how is that done? When the gospel is heard, Romans 10 and verse 17, and when the gospel is, is, is heard and we consider it and we are motivated to respond to God obediently, Romans 6, 17 and 18, then we have the forgiveness of our sins and new life. And if that faithful resolve and determination continues, then heaven will be our glorious inheritance. More about that in just a moment. Here's what's interesting. There is a corresponding reality when it comes to the subject of hell. Just as there are two ways to go to heaven, so there are two ways to go to hell. And you need to be informed about this as well so that you're able to make the right decisions. Hell is serious business. As we say when we, something is really serious, we say it's serious as a heart attack. Nothing is more serious than the subject of hell. Let's talk about those who will go to hell although they know the way of truth. What I say about this needs, of course, to be the Lord's judgment and not my own. I need to be humble before Him. and uh, I want to be humble every time I come into this pulpit and we talk about all of these important themes together. What I say needs to be the Lord's judgment and not mine. Some people know, some people know that they are in sin and they know that there is only one remedy for sin. They know that. But they do nothing about it. They do nothing about it. Others obeyed the gospel of grace. In the past, they became believers, but they've left that way and they have since turned back to the world and they've turned back into sin. And I want you to know that this is the worst position possible. This is the worst position to be in. Both groups possess an unholy commonality. They know what is right. They know the way that is right. They know what they ought to be doing, but they've chosen to be disobedient. They've chosen to disobey God. They've allowed sin to capture their hearts. They've allowed sin to capture, to get a hold of their lives. Here's the Bible's assessment of these individuals if we can go to the Scriptures. In 2 Peter chapter 2, Every Christian needs to read this and think about it and consider its import. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that, that's all of us. It's all of us. They are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Imagine, imagine the scriptures putting that out there like that. That there could be a situation where it would be better for people not to have heard the gospel 
or for people not to have known the way of righteousness. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having been washed to her wallowing in the mire. Wow. That's pretty strong language. Turn with me to another text. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Hebrews 6 and verse 4. In this text, he says this, beginning in verse 4 and reading down through verse uh, 6. He says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. That's, That's strong language. A little later, we recall this frightening prospect in Hebrews 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So you see what I'm saying? This puts us in a pretty bad place spiritually. It puts us in a pretty bad spot. So knowledge, what I'm saying is, knowledge is no guarantee of salvation. We need knowledge that is essential to the process, but we need to act on the knowledge that the Lord has given to us by His grace. This is the only guarantee of His grace. The only one that I know of through Jesus Christ. Let this be a warning, even a loving appeal. If you know the Word of God, it is important for you to be faithful to it. If you know the Word of God, it is a notable truth in the Scriptures that some who know the truth are going to be eternally lost. This doesn't have to be. doesn't have to be what happens to you personally. It doesn't have to be what happens to you. You need to hear the truth. You need to obey it. God is gracious to forgive. God is gracious and abounds in grace and mercy and in love. Come back to him. You should come back to him. And then last of all, some will go to hell even though they did not know the way of truth. And just let that simmer for just a minute. Some will be lost eternally because even though they did not know the way of truth. And I'm not talking about infants I'm not talking about small children who don't know sin. I'm talking about those who have sin in their lives, but they're not searching for God. They're not searching for God. They have a little appetite for for His grace. They have a little appetite for believing in Him, for searching for Him. They have a little appetite for truth. This must be, when I consider the fact that, that God sent His Son to die on the cross, and to go through all that Jesus went through. This must be a matter of great frustration to him. It's it's a matter of frustration to you and me as we think about so many who are lost. It is because of the pervasive reach of sin that God has made provision for the salvation of the whole world, for the millions of Africa, for the millions of, of, of Asia and South America and Australia, and right here at home in North America. He's made provision for this by means of the gospel of Christ. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Go and, and, and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And it is our responsibility, your responsibility and mine, to cooperate with God, to enlist in this work of sharing the gospel, the the message of salvation to those around us, to help others in their search for God. No responsible person leaves this world completely in innocence. Let's, I mean, let's just be very clear about that. No one leaves this world. You know, no responsible person leaves this world completely innocent. 
all of us, all of us, every last one of us, have experience in sin. None of us are without guilt. None of us have an excuse for sin. Some will die without the knowledge of the gospel. In fact, that's an understatement. Thousands die every day without hearing the gospel of Christ. That may not seem fair to you. People hear this and they, they many times they immediately say, That's not, that doesn't sound fair to me. But the Bible assures us that God will judge all of us in righteousness. God will not make any mistakes in judgment. He will not make any mistakes because He is a true and righteous God. In 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter um, 1, we read this, and it's talking about the righteous judgment of God towards His people and also towards those who are not His people. And listen to what is stated here by the Apostle Paul. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them, on those who do not know God. You see, there's the idea, do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Ah, that deserves some time. To, for us to think about what's being said and, and all of the different angles that, that, that Paul is addressing and, and approaching here in this, in this great text. This text speaks of the righteous judgment of God towards his people and toward those who don't know him and those who have not obeyed the gospel. The outcome is unmistakable. You can't miss what he's saying. God will judge righteously. But listen, Paul said to some who do not know God, who did not know God in his day, Acts 17, verse 30, truly these times of ignorance, or not knowing, truly these times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now, listen to me, now commands all men everywhere to repent. God is calling all of us to repentance. This is why the gospel must be proclaimed to every nation under heaven. This is what God has given us to do. You might think as a Christian, you know, I just don't have anything to do. Oh, yes, you do. You have a lot to do. You have a lot of people to talk to. You have a great message that you've got to share with your friends and neighbors and loved ones, those people in your own household sometimes. You have people to talk to and to love and to show them the way to God. God has given you that responsibility, and this is why the gospel must be proclaimed to every nation under heaven. Men and women are in sin. They are in dire straits. They need the gospel. The souls, their souls are in peril. If men and women are to be saved from sin, they must hear, and we're a part of that, a part of them hearing and then they need to respond to it in trust, in belief, and they need to obey the gospel of Christ. You know, Paul said in Romans 1, verse 16, he said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's just Paul's way of saying in, in, in first century vernacular, the gospel is for everyone. It's for everyone. If men and women will only believe. Jesus alone told us in John chapter 14 and verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you see, 
If Jesus is right, do we think Jesus is right? If Jesus is right, no one comes to the Father except through him. Then we've got to tell people about Jesus. We've got to tell them how they can be saved. I've given you the evidence. There are two ways to go to heaven. There are two ways to go to hell. Someone may object to that. Jesus said, there's only one way. He didn't use those, that exact terminology, but someone will say, well, Jesus said that there's only one way to go to heaven, and that's the narrow way. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Yes, Jesus said that, and what Jesus said is true. But Jesus was talking about one group of people, those who were old enough to decide between heaven and hell. And those who were listening to him on that occasion in the Sermon on the Mount, they could decide whether to follow Jesus or, or not. Jesus issued an imperative statement that can be understood only by those who are spiritually accountable. He instructed his listeners to enter. Enter in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few, there are few who find it. What Jesus said is true. He told us to enter and he spoke of the consequences. Just like this sermon, the sermon you're listening to today is not really for small children. I hope that your children can pick up on what I'm talking about and and that can become a part of their repertoire of, of knowledge that someday they'll become obedient to the gospel. But, but this sermon is really not for those children who can't decide for themselves. It's, it's for you. It's for you. Because you can decide. If you can hear to the point of comprehending, if you can choose between heaven and hell, then the Lord says you must choose. You must choose. God expects you to choose him over sin. And he expects you to do it today. He wants you. He implores you to do it today. The story is told of a stranger who was driving through a, a little town, a small town. But he needed directions. And he saw a young boy playing on the sidewalk. And, and so he pulled his car over and he asked the young boy um, how to get to a particular, particular destination. I guess the boy was being a little bit of a smart aleck. But he was correct in what he said. The boy said, well, mister, if you go in the direction you're headed, it'll be about 25,000 miles. If you turn around, it will only be about three miles. The greatest tragedy imaginable is for you to persist in living a life that's going nowhere but to hell. And we don't want that, and you don't want that, and most of all, the Lord doesn't want that. You'll find what you're looking for. You'll find what you were made for. You were created in His image. You'll find what you were made for only if you turn around and follow the way that leads to God and the way that He has prepared for you. The first decision you must make is to be obedient to the gospel and to live faithful to Him. Are you ready? Do you need to respond? I hope you'll do it now as together we stand and sing our invitation here. There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a bright day coming, a bright Friday coming by and by, but its brightness shall only come to them that love the Lord. Are you ready for that day to come? Judgment.
sad day coming by and by. When the sinner shall hear his doom, depart, I know ye not. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Sing this song as we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper this morning. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despise. The Nazareth, but we begin thy footsteps trod in streets and plains, the Son of God, but we believe thy footsteps trod in streets and plains, the Son of God. We saw thee not when lifted high amid that wild and savage crew, nor heard we that imploring cry, forgive they know not what they do, but we shook the earth and veiled the sun, but we believe that it was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. We gazed not in the open tomb where once thy mind gold body lay saw thee in that upper room, nor met thee on the open way. But we believe that angel said, why seek the living with the dead? But we believe that angel said, Seek the living with the dead. We walk not with the chosen few who saw thee from the earth ascend, who raised to have their wandering view, then low to earth all prostrate friends. gather around the Lord's table this morning to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. What Jesus did for us was prophesied many, many years before Jesus came by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53. I want to read a few verses from there and then make a couple of comments. Beginning in verse 3, 
speaking of Jesus, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. When we were at CYC last weekend, they had a video that uh, they called Sounds of the Cross. And this video depicted what Jesus went through. It was very, very moving, very, uh, um, very memorable. Uh, it had it showed the whip that they used to scourge Jesus. You know where they and it 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 didn't show the actual whip on a person's back, but it showed the whip and it made the sounds that the whip would make the lashing of the whip, and it had the sounds of a man crying out uh, as you would have if you were scourged with that whip. Uh, it had the sounds of the hammer with the nails hammering those nails into his hands and his feet. Uh, and it had the sounds of the uh, him saying, it is finished, him crying out, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Very moving uh, and a reminder that what Isaiah prophesied in the verses that we just read bore itself out in Christ dying on the cross. But uh, it was also the end of the video was the view from the tomb as a stone was rolled away, and as the uh, folks looked inside and saw that the tomb was empty, that Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead just like he said he would. Let's remember this morning the sacrifice that Jesus made, the pain, the anguish that he went through on our behalf so that we could have the opportunity, as Brian talked about in this lesson, of going to heaven and spending eternity there with Christ. I ask you to say Pray for the bread. So God, Father in heaven, thank you for being around this table. Remember that sacrifice of your son. And as we partake of this bread that represents that body that was beaten for us on our behalf, Father, we just ask that we partake of this bread in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We give thanks for the fruit of the vine.
Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful, thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. We're so thankful for this fruit of the vine, which is the shed blood of Christ. Pray we'll examine ourselves and take it manner and please in thy sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Take this as an opportunity while the men are gathered in the front to take up a collection. This is another aspect of our worship that uh, God commands us through Scripture to give as we have been prospered, uh, to give cheerfully, and uh, to give according to, uh, to what we have all been blessed with. Uh, we all have been blessed in many ways, and this is our opportunity to uh, show our gratitude to Christ and to, to God for the blessings. So I ask Alan to give thanks for the offering today. Gracious Father, we're so thankful for this day. Thank you for allowing us to gather here. Thank you, Father, for the jobs and the opportunities that you have given us that uh, we are able to earn an income. Father, we ask that you help us to uh, to give back from the portion of what we uh, have earned to you and to your house. Then help, Father, it to be used uh, in a manner that is uh, pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' every name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.
Good to see everyone here this morning. Again, if you're visiting, we're glad you chose to be with us today. We do have a fellowship meal. We'd invite you to stay. Um, just a reminder for our members, um, please allow the visitors to go first and a few minutes for us to set up uh, final preparations before we have our meal. So uh, welcome you all to stay. We'll meet back here around between 1 and 1.15 for our, our afternoon worship Devo service. So if you'll be standing, we'll sing the new song, first and third verse. It thrills my soul to hear these songs of praise. We mortals sing below. And though it takes the burning of the wage, yet I must onward go. I hope to hear through out of number days the soul earth cannot Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for this opportunity to worship you. We're thankful for this opportunity to sing and, and worship and, and me in, in awe of you, Lord, as we praise you and give you the honor and glory. Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have of heaven. We thank you for the, the 
crown of life that we are promised and that we look so forward to. And Lord, we just are so looking forward to that day when we can hear the chorus sing. Lord, thank you for the food that's been prepared, for those who have prepared it. Lord, I pray that you will bless this time of fellowship and that you will make everyone feel welcome and that we will do the best job we can to be Christians in front of others. God, we thank you so much for your blessings. We thank you for your forgiveness. We ask that you continue to forgive us, to love us, to guide us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.